Welcome to season two of The Reflection. We started this series in March 2020 after the announcement of the lockdown and COVID-19 began to change the world. For 20 weeks, academics, activists and journalists joined us to discuss everything from the UK government's mishandling of the pandemic, the growth of conspiracies, Black Lives Matter and what it was like to bear witness to the growth of existing local and global inequalities. For this season, our guests will be reflecting on the political climate of the past year and we'll be talking to authors who have released books in 2020 concerning matters of race and class. This is a trigger warning. This episode, at times, contains conversations and sensitive material that people may find difficult to listen to. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Reflection. Um, it is just me and Tiso in the studio. Yo. Um, we have... Oh, and also George, obviously. Sorry, George. <laughs> George, has gotten, George has got a noise, as I said. Well, George, I want you to come on the show and talk on the show. The listeners want to hear your voice. Like, Do you want to come on the show? He, he has got no? a voice. He does speak. He does speak. He's no, a real he person. He's a real person. And he's now looking at me piss, pissed off. Don't edit this out. <laughs> he, he, he's a real person. <laughs> anyway, so... This is going to be a bit of a reflective episode about the fact that we are coming up to 20 years since 9-11. We do have a special spotlight episode that will be either before or after this episode comes out, which has got um, people with both lived experience, academic credentials and understand a lot more about how this moment or 2011 became such a significant point of entrenched embedded universalized islamophobia uh, uh, globally mm -hmm. obviously me and tiso are, we have a kind of a partial analysis of it but it's not necessarily it's more kind of anecdotal i think i'm just going to start off by saying t so mm -hmm. when 9 11 happened i was 11 was i 11 yeah no yeah i was always oh, a 12 i was 12 well, I mean, I need to wait how old i was man, 19, i was born in 92 one second, one second, so one second. i'm 11 yeah George just said I'm 14. We already told you listeners, George cannot count. Um, so I was 11 and I remember going to school. Do you know what? I'm, do you know what? The other, the other thing that I remember really viscerally is 7-7. Seven, seven. I think I remember more that more than 9-11. But I was going, I was walking to school. So um, when you walk to school, um, you go, go to your friend's house, each friend's house on the way. I remember going to my first friend's house and all her family being sat in the lounge and just watching the planes go through uh, the towers. Twin towers. I can, I honestly, I remember it so, so well. Like just seeing like those images and then being at school and all the teachers having the TVs on, just watching. I would say that I think in more recent years on the podcast, when I've been talking about my own lived experience of growing up and talking talking about racism and talking about class, etc., and gender, I think that one of the things that I've definitely come to well, I've been trying to grapple with myself is how widespread and how embedded Islamophobia was where I lived in the West Midlands, and I don't think. I was a kid, obviously, but I just don't think I paid it enough attention. And I don't think I had the kind of critical analysis that I have now. Like, if you look back at, at what that must have been like for, like, Muslim children, like, going to school, like, families, like, across the West in particular, like, how awful life must have been. Like, it just makes me just, it just makes me so sad and... I just feel like I didn't quite understand what was happening because I was 11, obviously. But I knew that there were just so many white people around me that were just vex. And it was just like a real, it was such a, like we look at it now, it was such a watershed moment politically, wasn't yeah, it's, it? It's a shock, right? It's a, it's a shock because I was 23 when it happened. Were you? Yeah. Fucking hell. Man, like I said, you, man was been out. You're grown. Huh? <laughs> I, was, I was out and about. So man was, I was off watching TV because it's coming from a dentist. I'm, I'm about and about in the streets, so I see my pals. So most of my pals were Muslim guys at the time. They they were trying to strike the balance. I remember at the time, like, not the jubilation that this has happened because obviously this is a bad thing that's happened. All these people died. But they were, the, the thing that was coming out from them was like, that's what America gets. As in, they've been bullying people all around the world where we're from for all this time. And someone, they, the analogy someone gave at the time was, it's like a bully getting punched in the nose. And and, I, and and so all, all my white mates, because obviously it's a mixed group, they would get angry and get upset. But they were trying to say, no, like 
we're upset because people died because there's Muslim people that's died in there as well, right? But they're saying, but America's been killing our people for this many years and so something was bound to happen. That was the argument that was given at the time. And what do you remember? So, do you where did you kind of sit? Like, did you do you remember what you, so, were, no, thinking, I, you were just sort of no, trying to piece together what had happened? No, and I, I sat there and I could I could empathise with that kind of argument. I could see the logic because I, I understand that. So, for example, where my parents are from, Grenada, America has gone there and invaded and changed the place. So this country's gone around and it's spread with its might, but nothing's ever happened to them in retaliation. And you and it's always understanding when you're marginalised, people can only push you so far until something happens back, right? There's like a cause and effect. So 9-11 is, didn't just happen in a vacuum, right? There's, a, there's, there's cause and effect to these things. And I think it's for, I guess my argument now is, not my argument now, but it's what, what I can say now is maybe this is the start of the kind of, the, the kind of, the, the kind of, the backlash of, of against Western civilization, right? So you're seeing this whole thing unravel. Since that point, it's been an unraveling of stuff, of whiteness, or of, of masculinity. All these things have been against the under, against the very notion of the Enlightenment. People are questioning and pushing back, and the West has felt uncomfortable. So, the, uh, Bin Laden and and, uh, and the misadventure in Afghanistan was all because trying to exercise Western might. Now. If we look back at that time, we, that pi- it reminds me of that picture of Obama, like sat like with his yeah. like stroking his chin, yeah, like yeah. watching as I find um, Bin Laden. It's quite. But ironically, picture. before the invasion, the Taliban offered Bin Laden to America to go to the Hague, right? And Bush turned it down, and said, "No, we'd rather invade rather than go to the Hague, right?" So this, this, these, these are things that actually happened. But like I said, given to we are twenty years later, we've seen the unraveling of Western values, and you can see this in how. The West have pushed back. They're scared of their civilization. Islamophobia has grown because they've defined themselves as the other more so now, right? So there's been this constant unraveling and maybe 9-11, maybe we'll look back in 50 years time and say, this was the start. That was the start because ever since then, you've seen the West being unsure of themselves and their place in the world, given the rise of China, Russia, and all those things that's happened all at the same time. The West seems unsure of themselves, which... Given their position prior to prior, given their position for most of the 20th century, that's unheard of, right? But for the first time, the West seems unsure of themselves, and this has only got worse. And you can see in the anxieties, and again, I, Nikki's work's quite good on, on anxieties. You can see that in the anxieties of the West, man, anxieties around masculinity, anxieties around whiteness, anxieties around, around Islam like, are they coming to invade us? No, we're not. Most people, most victims of terrorist attacks happen to be Muslims themselves in other countries. 1% happens here. But the anxiety is there. The anxiety of being swamped by loads of immigrants coming over from different countries. We take less refugees, right? But that anxiety is still there. Given, given we know the reality and this maybe 9-11 was the start of that, that anxiety. Like shit. Mm. They done the unthinkable, right? These, a group of people done the unthinkable bloody the nose of the superpower at that time remember we're not too far from Francis Fukuyama's argument of the end of history in the last man so America represents a neoliberal heaven right it, it, it won it won everything There's, it's the only superpower left it had masses of so, uh, um, so, um, masses of cultural influence massive political influence they spend 700 billion on arms right but yet this small group of people had turned this shit upside down and since then, since then, it's been a shit show, right? It's been a shit show. They've invaded, invaded Afghanistan. Nothing's happened. Invaded Iraq. The shift has not been what you would think it's been. Given that this was the only superpower, and for the last century and a half, it was it could do what it wanted. It, it fought many proxy wars, right? But in the twentieth century, things have changed, man. And that anxiety has felt through. And then you're seeing things like the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, questioning, pushing back. Uh, post-colonial studies being viewed in a different way, being put, put, being being made mainstream, a whole a whole generation of people below that are questioning this this edifice, man. And I'm saying, like, what the fuck, man? Can you imagine if your people in power, you're like this? What the fuck? Brexit, right? Brexit is the only anomaly in there, right? It seems to go counter to the way things are going. Mm. But we'll see what happens now, boy. Now you are feeling it. Four years later, we'll see where you end up now, man. You're on the wrong side of history. I told you then. <laughs> I told you in 2016. I'm telling you again in 2021. Coming back to 
the sort of early noughties tea, mm. um, and I'm going to go back to, yeah, schoolgirl Chantel. Mm. One of the things that's really kind of visceral, uh, visceral memories for me, and I think Ron Ware's um, writing on this stuff is really, really helpful in terms of thinking about nation and militarization and the Iraq war. Mm. So schoolgirl Chantel, one of the things that I remember really well is how organized the army recruitment became within the West Midlands. So I've spoken, I think I've spoken about this before um, on the show, but I was in like, obviously bottom set for everything at school. Not obviously, but I was. Um, <laughs> I was in bottom set for everything at school and the army used to come into our, um, our into our classes and try and recruit us. <laughs> um, this is just obviously post 16, but they were getting us to, like trying to get us to come to the cadets. And there was one point where I was like, yeah, maybe I'll go into army. Maybe I'll go and go and fight in the, in the war. Like, mm. do you know what I mean? Because I didn't, yeah. I like wasn't, positioned I was labelled in a certain way at school which meant I didn't think that I could have there was any hope for me educationally but that's a really big memory for me is that the army coming into school a lot like at least once a term if not more the other thing I remember is a lot of people at school I was in high school going to Iraq um, and a, um, someone that I went to school with died as well in Iraq and it's like a obviously that's sad um but it's a kind of visceral like localized memory i have of this kind of post 2001 britain and then the other thing again i've said before just trying to remember more being more critical about is how widespread like racist name calling and islamophobic name calling became and i'm not saying that it wasn't around before 9 11 but like it was really really it was really mainstream like it was really mainstream and then obviously you then get this wasn't when i was at school but like you get prevent comes in yeah to pathologize the other right so obviously this discourse has always existed in especially post enlightenment of the idea of the other so the west has always defined itself as the west and it's 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 other is the east right and so this pathology to kind of define what this new person was this radicalized terrorist where they come from and this whole agenda it, it's mad how it almost was obviously these things like i said they're not created in a vacuum they've always existed in different bits but they've kind of i don't know how they did it man like because up until all, that they used all the apparatus yeah. they use all the state apparatus they use education mm-hmm. they use the media they use government because like i said you remember when i when i first did my phd and i, I put the idea that white white young white men have been radicalized and no one really paid attention to me because mm. all the literature was focused on uh, Asian men, from especially so I so in my flats where I grew up, prevent would come onto the estates, and so you'd see like th- them taking young men away, oh, and it's yeah. a madness, right? So I think it's really important just to sort of caveat the things that me and Tiso are talking about is that obviously, like our Muslim brothers and sisters are not. Um, have not been passive victims in in all this stuff that's been happening yeah, since yeah. 2001. There's been so much amazing resistance and alternate like storytelling that centres the voices of Muslims across the world and obviously locally in Britain where we are. Like I don't want. I'm obviously talking about from my point of view. I'm talking about growing up and and, remem- and kind of remembering Again. how mainstream it was. But equally, like there, there's always resistance, and we yeah, have. Yeah. We don't want to ever position those that have been on the margins of people that just take this shit like they don't like people fucking tell people to go fuck themselves which is important it's Mm. important to always remember about struggle and resistance but again 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 we're not this is not a fully a full academic exposition of it as well so this is again it it touches on recollection anecdotal stuff and just sometimes how we felt at that time man which i think chantel what chantel said is needed but it was just a weird time man like i said when i sit there think back i grew up in a predominantly muslim area their, their response and like I said they, they weren't dancing in the street like no. it wasn't like that what they was was a conflict in them like they want to say to them yeah that America not deserved it but that's what happened but equally it's a sad thing they were sad for people that died right being in the space being in the country that was they couldn't really be vocal about how they felt because you're a marginalised community speaking bad about western people and they, that's how you're it was interpreted. Forced, you're just kind of forced into silence. Yeah, so it was hard for, to, to voice that point of view at that time 
It was a madness, man. Like so. And let me tell you, that was not happening in the West Midlands suburbs. <laughs> I remember I, I was working for a car company, car rental company at the time. So it was a lot of Asian guys, um, Bengali boys working with us at the time, and most of the management were all white English. Right. So you could imagine the fights, the, the, the argument. So obviously, a big, this big event happens. So people are talking about it and not really working. But so the white management essentially took the position like. It's been this attack on us, it's attack on Western modernity, this, that, and the other. And the, the Asian guys were saying, but. You've but, been attacking but, us. Exactly. But neither position is. You can review in isolation. There has to be some kind of. It's, they're relational, right? So they were never going to agree because they, they weren't seeing the relational point of it. They were saying, this has happened to us, but this has happened to us. And so it became of, like, but this has happened to us all the time. And that kind of argument. It was. Mm. It's, it's interesting to see that play out. And I don't know. I guess I guess just to sort of summarise the thing that's really important I think to add to our kind of recollective anecdotal conversation about 20 years since 9-11 is that yes these things are relational but we have to always centre power so who continues to be the most marginalised who continues to have their lives torn apart who continues to have to have their religion their ways of life stigmatised and pathologised it is it, it is our Muslim brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, it's not the white guys in the office. I think I think Chantel's uh, bang on, hundred percent. It's about power, man. You have to centre power in relation. So, twenty years later, where does the West see itself? Right? What does it see itself as? It, what's 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 its role twenty years later? Mm. In two thousand and one, it saw itself as the world's policeman. I think that's such an important point, T. And yeah, I just hope that we can get like things will get better. Yeah, I, I, I don't but know. It's not, it's not, it's not on the horizon, but. But I, I, maybe, maybe the West, like I said, dude, because it's a whole point about Western modernity and how it perceives itself, how it sees itself. Mm-hmm. There is a kind of um, a reassessment of what it means to be Western, right? Definitely. So, are they they can't go around civilizing places anymore. No. So, what's their role? What is their role? What is their role? Given that they define themselves by that for such a long time, even though quickly the best contrast would be China's role china doing the same thing colonization but they're being pragmatic about it so they're going to say i'll build your road but you know you're going to be in my debt and both countries know what the score is right mm-hmm. and so the west are trying to we the west are trying to say what is our position then because they've taken that role so the west's response is we can offer you that but we're going to be transparent they don't care <laughs> they don't care oh on that note he so yeah yeah listeners thank you so much for supporting us thank you so much for staying with us and in love and solidarity as always, always. Our Muslim brothers and sisters and we'll see you again next week thank Laters. you bye. Bye, bye. bye thank you for listening to the T's and C's with T's and Chantel you can now continue the conversation with us on Twitter and Instagram 